Hey, it's Sam, and this is the third episode of The Pornhub Empire. In this episode, I talked to a woman who was coerced into making a pornographic film that was later posted to Pornhub. She wasn't alone. How did a scandal involving sexual abuse material seriously damage the lives of many and nearly destroy the company? We're going to find out. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to CBC Podcasts to catch the final installment of The Pornhub Empire. Just a note before we start that we'll be talking about sexual violence in this episode. So yeah, somewhere about 10 years ago, I was in college and everything was was going well, right? I was doing good in school. I was managing social life, work, friends. I was managing, but then it came to a point where I couldn't make ends meet, and there's where I fell down a rabbit hole. And I mean, again, that's where we start to get into the GDP story. So I'm not sure if you want me to just continue or... or. We're going to call this woman Jane. For reasons that will become clear, we're protecting her identity. You know, my mom was a model, so... I had, you know, I was blessed with some good genes and people would always be like, oh, like you could be a model, you can make easy money, like, uh, because I did not, like, there just wasn't enough time in the day for me to do full-time school and a full-time job. And my part-time jobs weren't cutting it, so. Jane went looking online for one-off gigs on places like Craigslist. She posed for a bikini ad, she sat for a makeup artist portfolio, And she came across a post for what appeared to be a modeling agency. So I responded and it was basically like two or three months of correspondence, but mostly on their end. They got my number. They're like, let's talk on the phone. It was some Australian guy. Sounds super professional. I look back. I'm like, well, I was so naive. But at the time, it didn't seem that I was going to be tricked. Now I have a much different outlook on life. So and again, it was very vague as to like what was the job in the beginning it was modeling right I was okay with like even some nude modeling and then it it went to them slowly kind of changing the story and being like well it's like an adult film and you know it's super professional and using all these words to convince me as well as the I don't even know hundreds of other girls that it, you know, it was legit. So I was getting desperate and they kept calling and it was like fate in, in the worst of ways. It was Thanksgiving break. Jane was going home for the holidays. And it turns out this so-called modeling agency is going to be in her city that same weekend. Jane was uncomfortable with the idea of doing an adult film But the man she was corresponding with assured her that it was all very tasteful, artistic even. She was told that her name would never be attached, her face wouldn't be shown, and the footage would only be sold to private collectors in Australia on DVD. A videographer met her in the lobby of an upscale hotel and brought her up to a small room. Jane was expecting a whole production team, but it was just two men and a freelance makeup artist who quickly left. At first, the men were friendly, but their demeanor changed. They became abrupt, rude, and then violent. I, like, hid deep down in my subconscious or something. There was no more of me being present because I was so, sh- like, taken aback. I was I was just like, I can't do, what, what am I supposed to do now? I mean, I just, like, did not feel like I could leave. I mean, I knew I couldn't. He just, you know, grabbed me and, and violated me. And um, it's, it's really scary, or it was really scary. And even looking back on it 10 years later, I still don't, think I could have left. Jane was abused that day, on camera. It was horrific. But at least, she thought, it was over. It was like, 
it was just one big shock. And I kept thinking it was just a nightmare that it didn't happen. You know, when I went back to school, I just was like, okay, like I'm going to have to live with this for the rest of my life. Like that this happened to me, that I was violated, that I'm an idiot and I let this happen to me. And, you know, at least like I'm alive and at least like nobody knows, has to know about this. And I was pretty confident with the fact that that was going to be the end of it. (laughs) And I went back to living, trying to live my life in school. And basically like two months later. A few months later, a video of her assault was posted online with her name, her school, her eye color, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Pornhub. It just goes viral, and it spreads around to probably every single person you know, and more. And that was where, I mean, it was like I was on suicide watch by my, my, my all my close friends, so... It got really dark. I'm Samantha Cole. This is Episode 3, Pornhub's Disgrace. Jane didn't realize it yet, but she was one of more than 100 victims of the sex trafficking operation Girls Do Porn, or GDP. I started investigating GDP in 2019, after 22 women sued the owners and operators with claims of fraud, coercion, and misrepresentation. This was in a San Diego civil court where the company was based. The women's testimonies followed the same pattern as Jane's. A misleading advertisement, a contract signed under duress, a pornographic video filmed under the promise that it would never leave collector's markets in Australia and New Zealand. Every time, that proved to be a lie. The owners of GDP would upload the videos around the internet, including to porn sites like Pornhub, The site's massive mainstream popularity meant that the victim's classmates, family, coworkers, and friends could see them. Some of these videos posted to Pornhub were viewed more than 40 million times. GDP existed as its own standalone pay site, but it was also a Pornhub content partner, where short clips were available for free And longer videos were available with a paid Pornhub premium subscription. It was one of the most popular channels on the site. Pornhub didn't cut ties with GDP until the owners and employees were indicted on charges of sex trafficking, months after the first civil trial began. The official videos were removed. But GDP clips continued to live on the site, uploaded by users. Every time I'd publish a story about the case, I'd hear from another victim, asking for help to get these videos taken down. By early 2020, I'd even published a full how-to guide on how to get non-consensual videos taken off Pornhub. Because the issue went beyond GDP's criminal enterprise. I definitely heard about people having videos taken of them, either with or without their consent, but then being posted without their consent on sites like Pornhub and people's lives really being destroyed. And I do remember thinking at the time that because Pornhub didn't require even just photos of people's IDs, which is so 101 for any other adult content site, that it would never, it would be so much less of an issue. Obviously, that's Liara Rue. They're an independent porn performer and writer. And they're identifying a dangerous flaw in Pornhub's model. The fact that any user could anonymously upload whatever they wanted. That led to issues with piracy on the site, 
And it also meant that abuse material, even child sexual abuse material, was being posted too. Professional porn studios have to follow what's called 2257 regulations, which require producers to get proof of age for every model they shoot. But Pornhub, despite being the best known porn site in the world, operated more like YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, sites that rely on user-generated content. Users were allowed to post without verifying their identity. And while there were rules forbidding users from uploading illegal material, those rules were not enforced rigorously enough. Despite their reservations with the site, Liara started posting their own videos to Pornhub when the company started courting performers with ways to monetize their content, like offering a share of ad revenue. But the persistent reports of non-consensual material winding up on the site and the way the company handled those reports turned them off. I decided that I needed to leave when I saw that Pornhub was pushing back in a way that was basically basically denying that this type of content was ever really posted on there and was saying that it was entirely overblown and was also refusing to respond to criticism from performers who were pointing out that their refusal to verify performers and their encouragement of piracy was what was allowing this to even be an issue in the first place. Liara wasn't the only one with serious reservations about the platform. By 2019, Noelle Perdue, who you heard from in the last episode, was working on MindGeek's clip site. It's called Model Hub and allows performers to sell their content. Before she quit, Noelle was also hearing concerns in the industry about Pornhub's setup. My job kind of at Model Hub was to act as like a go-between between between the adult industry and Pornhub. And and so a lot of my job was talking to executive or not executive level, but, you know, director level people being like, hey, like this is why this is why this super popular creator doesn't want to sign up with Pornhub. Like if you want to get her on your site, this is what you'll have to change. Like that was kind of my role. And a lot of the feedback that I would get from creators and independent performers was definitely about the dangers of allowing unverified uploads. So that was kind of a conversation that was happening constantly uh, for the entire time that I was there was, was me being like, hey, like this is preventing a huge number of creators from joining. Like what's the status on that? Like what's happening? And And generally the answer was always, Like, we're working on it. It's going to take a long time. You know, it's a big change. We're working on it. The criticism wasn't just coming from inside the adult industry. In February 2020, a campaign called Trafficking Hub was launched with a petition. It stated that Pornhub had been, quote, enabling, distributing, and profiting from rape, child sexual abuse, sex trafficking, and criminal image-based sexual abuse, end quote. The petition called for Pornhub to be shut down. By the fall of that year, it had more than 2 million signatures. On December 4th, 2020, the New York Times published an article that would change Pornhub and the public's perceptions of it forever. The piece, an opinion column written by New York Times veteran Nicholas Kristof, was headlined The Children of Pornhub. In it, Kristof spoke with a 19-year-old girl who at 14 was coaxed into sending a nude video to a boy she had a crush on. The boy shared the video with other boys, and someone posted it on Pornhub. Her mother managed to get it taken down, but it would pop up over and over, on Pornhub and on other sites. 
The article contained a number of alarming stories like this. Christoph wrote that Pornhub was, quote, infested with rape videos. He suggested that the major credit cards should suspend their relationship with the site. Pornhub gave a statement to Christoph, included in the piece, where they said that any assertion that they allowed child sexual abuse material on the site was irresponsible and flagrantly untrue, and that they had a comprehensive, industry-leading trust and safety policy to identify and eradicate illegal material from their sites. But it's hard to overstate the impact of this op-ed. It was enormous and swift. The company's cheeky, fun brand identity the one they'd worked so hard to cultivate over the years, was destroyed, practically overnight. Within the week, Visa and MasterCard announced they would stop processing payments on Pornhub. It was the most serious blow to the site in its then 13-year history. In Christoph's New York Times story, he name-checks that big trafficking hub petition and the activist behind it, Lila Micklewaite. Micklewaite is the former director of abolition at Exodus Cry, an anti-trafficking organization that lobbies to, quote, end the sex industry. Another person referenced in the piece is a lawyer with the National Center on Sexual Exploitation formerly known as Morality in Media. Here's their president, Patrick Truman, addressing the 2013 Utah Coalition Against Pornography Conference in a video titled, Hope in a Pornified World. It's on their official YouTube channel. These issues, what we're fighting, what we're all fighting in these various campaigns is the sexual revolution. Now that's a dignified name But the sexual revolution is really an insurrection against Almighty God. These organizations and others born out of the religious right have made Pornhub one of their primary targets. They don't just want Pornhub to change, they want Pornhub gone. And because of Pornhub's symbolic power as the biggest name in the business, many of those I talked to for this podcast say that it feels more like a war on porn itself. This is Pornhub's argument, too. In the aftermath of the Kristoff piece, they put out a statement that read, in part, it is clear that Pornhub is being targeted not because of our policies and how we compare to our peers, but because we are an adult content platform, end quote. And child sexual abuse material and other forms of non-consensual content aren't just a problem for adult sites like Pornhub. These materials are posted all over the internet. In 2020, shortly after the Trafficking Hub petition was launched, a spokeswoman for the UK-based Internet Watch Foundation, which identifies and removes child sexual abuse imagery online, told Reuters that popular social media sites and apps, quote, pose more of an issue of sexual abuse material than Pornhub does. After Christoph's op-ed came out, Carrie Goldberg, a lawyer renowned for combating non-consensual imagery online, tweeted, For every one case involving a rape tape on Pornhub, I have 50 involving rape and child sexual abuse material being disseminated on Instagram and Facebook. Pornhub is far from perfect, but mainstream big tech is far worse. Meta, the parent company of Instagram and Facebook, told us they aggressively and proactively combat child sexual abuse material on and off their platforms, with dedicated reporting options, sophisticated technology to detect and remove child exploitation content, and cooperation with law enforcement. Still, you don't hear many calling for all these other sites to be taken down altogether. 
This isn't to say all of Pornhub's critics are religiously motivated. The problems you've heard described in this episode obviously outraged many across the political spectrum, including Canadian Senator Julie Mivelle Deschenes, who was appointed by the Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. I was trolled. I was trolled by, by uh, obviously, I don't know who on the internet. And um, some of those trolls were saying that I was manipulated by the American evangelist. Well, this was an effort to, to undermine what I was doing, you know. She's made pornography one of her big causes as a politician, protesting outside MindGeek's office in Montreal, calling for a full criminal investigation into the company, and sponsoring controversial legislation to verify the ages of people just looking at Pornhub, something we'll talk more about in the next episode. I know very well. Uh, I've never been manipulated by anybody. You know, this is a cause that I'm carrying for reasons that have nothing to do with with being a Puritan. You know, I believe in sexual education. I think those questions need to be discussed, uh, transparent. I'm not there to close Pornhub. I'm a strong woman, and I obviously resent that kind of, in French we say, salissage, you know, because obviously the idea is to try to, um, how do you say in English, blacken the reputation or to, uh, of, of somebody. So no. So, you know, obviously in Canada, I have support from all groups with dif- from different ideologies, but I'm my own person. I do that because I believe in it. In the days immediately following Christoph's New York Times article, Pornhub announced some major changes. They removed the ability to download content from the site, a feature that had allowed users to export a video, save it on their personal device, and reshare it later. And more significantly, Pornhub stopped accepting uploads from unverified users. Here's Noel again. It was very frustrating. Yeah, very, very frustrating because, again, the feedback that I had gotten for years was that they were working on it. It's going to take a long time. You know, the website's old. It's difficult to put that in place, you know, but but we have we have a lot of people working on it. Just like, again, like I can't stress enough how many conversations I had about verification where that was the response. And then to see it happen essentially overnight was so frustrating <laughs> where I was like, okay, you were fully lying to me and you were fully lying to me and you were fully lying to like every performer on your website who has been calling for this for literally a decade or more. And it's so sad that it did go that way. I think it's just, I think we really, the whole industry took such a hit. I ultimately After changing their verification policy, Pornhub purged millions of videos. I checked the site on a Sunday evening that December, and there were 13.5 million videos up there. The following morning, there were 4.7 million. It was a dramatic overhaul. But for Noel and for Liara and others in the adult industry, these changes came too late. And if they had responded genuinely to to accusations that had been circulating for months, if not years, if they actually cooperated with media, if they addressed these these fundamental risks in their model that had been brought up to them time and time again, I just don't think it would have gone down that way. And and I think that we lost we lost so much in that period and and in the fact that it did happen the way it did. At the end of the day, Pornhub really was, by the nature of the piracy that they encouraged, allowing this sort of content to proliferate on there. And seeing how hard and how long they pushed to prevent both protections for 
survivors of child sexual assault and performers themselves. It really disgusted me and it, I think, resulted in the industry as a whole being painted with a very negative brush, which unfortunately the industry is under constant scrutiny and under constant attack from right-wing Christian organizers who essentially want us all dead and gone. And having a site like Pornhub that was just not doing their due diligence on behalf of performers and on behalf of survivors really allowed certain elements to have a field day. For Jane and survivors like her, the damage was egregious. The men who hurt her in the hotel room that day are now in prison, convicted on sex trafficking-related charges. But the recordings have followed her for nearly 10 years. After making it through college, Jane excelled in her professional life. I asked not to be in any public, like, forum, you know. I didn't want to be acknowledged for my success, but I was anyway. And with that, there was maybe 24 hours of all this joy and excitement and, and you know, you know, for once, like, you're being proud of yourself. And then in a split second, the next morning, waking up, and it's just, you know, like, it's it's the first time all over again, the first outing all over again. That was like the last <laughs> knife in the chest for sure of like the, the big ones. Cause I was like, oh, maybe I'm going to get away with it, which seems crazy to say, but like get away with, it's not going to follow me into this next stage of my life. Um, but it did. And, and Jane has been outed over and over again in different parts of her life. And then obviously- Trolls share links to the video and screenshots from it sometimes with her identifying information on different platforms online. It haunts her. Um, So even to this day, it's like, I almost try to, you know, just ask my husband to Google search my name, Google search my name with GDP, Google search my name with porn, look on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Twitter was always the worst for me because it's tough to see. You're like, oh, okay, like nothing's really there anymore, right? Like, or very minimal again. And it's hard because you're like, I'm having a good day. Screw it. I'm going to look it up just to just to check, you know, and then you find stuff and you're like back in it again. And then not, not even you find the link or the picture. You find the horrible, horrible things people are saying that just like even if you're so strong and like you've gotten over it or you've gone through it, it's still really hard to see it constantly, like the constant reminder that this happened to you and the majority of the public think you're like this low life piece of shit, you know, whore that wants to make her way up a ladder or just, you know, use her body to become famous, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, most of my friends and and, and normal people, there are some people that come and like, good for her or, you know, leave these women alone. like. You're the one that's, you know, looking for it. Uh, You're the one that's getting pleasure from it. So like, what's with the, you know, why do you, why do you have to be so horrible about it? So it's, it's like, it's really tough. Let's just say again, to this day. Jane's video was scrubbed from Pornhub, but it took far too long. And she still holds the company responsible. I don't know. I wish it went down differently, of course. And I wish that they, you know, honored me along with all the other victims, you know, begging them to take the videos down. They should have just banned it like completely. Like if if anything was ever reposted or again, I don't know how it works in the back end for them, but like they, 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 their system should have been, you know, better at, at controlling what, what content was there and what wasn't. In 2021, Pornhub's parent company settled a lawsuit with Jane and 50 other victims of the Girls Do Porn case. This past fall, another, bigger suit was launched against ALO, formerly MindGeek, arguing that the company failed to take down videos of their abuse. 
It's one of a handful of ongoing lawsuits against the company. In December 2023, federal prosecutors announced that ALO admitted it had received proceeds of sex trafficking in the GDP case, though ALO did not plead guilty to any crime. As I read through the statement of facts, I saw mention of my own reporting. Employees of the company, including senior executives, had circulated a piece I wrote on the Girls Do Porn scheme in the summer of 2019. They knew women were saying they'd been coerced, but they kept making money off of GDP until that October, when they removed the official channel from their platforms. As part of an agreement with prosecutors, ALO will pay damages to the victims, as well as a $1.8 million fine, and submit to independent third-party monitoring of their trust and safety protocols for three years. A statement from ALO says that the company deeply regrets hosting any GDP content. On the final episode of the Pornhub Empire, I talk to the new owners of Pornhub and look at where the site's left standing today. We're not ashamed of it. We're not ashamed that that's what the platform is about, which means you have to be able to say that publicly. And, you know, there are many private equity firms can make all kinds of acquisitions and never talk about, are you proud of what your company does? You know, what do you mean am I proud? It's an investment. I invested in it. And maybe there are some companies that they shouldn't be proud of the work that we're doing. We are fundamentally proud of the work that we're doing. You've been listening to The Pornhub Empire, Understood. This series is produced by CBC Podcasts and CBC News. The show was written by producer Imogen Burchard with me, Samantha Cole. Associate producer, Sam Connert. Sound design by Julia Whitman and Sam Connert. Sarah Clayton is our digital coordinating producer. Executive producers are Cecil Fernandez, Chris Oak, and Nick McCabe-Locos. Locos.